This hearing will come to order. I want to thank Chairman Kaufman for working with me today on this joint hearing, and thank you all for being with us today. Additionally, several of our witnesses today are veterans, and I want to thank you all for your service and for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here. The federal government <clears throat> has a goal of awarding 3 percent of all prime contracts to service-disabled veterans owned small businesses. Last year, this meant over $12 billion in prime contracts that went to those firms. In helping agencies meet the 3 percent goal, Congress created two contracting programs, one specifically for the Department of Veteran Affairs and government-wide programs run by small business, the Small Business Administration. Whenever we have small business contracting program, programs, the government faces certain tensions. First, we have an obligation to ensure that only qualifying firms are receiving and performing on these contracts. Second, we must ensure that the programs themselves do not become so burdensome that they keep small businesses from participating. The contracting programs for service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses highlights this tension. As the SBA program has not done enough to discourage fraud, while the VA program has itself become the problem for some of these firms. In some cases, the differences between the two programs has itself led to opportunities for fraud and bureaucratic impediments to small business generation. For example, the surviving spouses of service-disabled veterans are allowed to maintain the business's status for a period of time at the VA, but not under the SBA. In, contract, in contrast, the VA regulation, a, a service-disabled veteran in a, community, in a community property state must convince their spouse to renounce any interest in the business in order to prove that the veteran controls the firm. SBA does not apply this restriction, instead simply requiring that a firm updates its status when its ownership changes. The bottom line is that there is a legitimate firm may qualify under one program but not under another. If we really want to help these firms, we need to give them one clear set of rules to live by. Recent GAO reports have highlighted the problems with both the VA and the SBA. <coughs> And many believe that legislation is required to create programs that have clear requirements, efficient processes, and transparent appellate processes. Over the course of this Congress, I plan to work alongside my colleagues on the Veterans Affairs Committee and with the represent representatives of service disabled veterans on a solution that will improve the current processes by which both agencies operate. Small businesses have enough on their plate and I hope today's hearing will provide some ins great insight on how to best serve disabled veterans-owned small businesses to deal with these additional burdens. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today and look forward to your testimony. I now yield to the, ch the chairman of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations for Veterans Affairs, Mr. Kaufman, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman Hanna, uh, for yielding, and thank you also uh, to your subcommittee for holding this joint hearing. Uh, the problems with uh, VA's service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, the certification uh, program, uh, is sadly, uh, they, these are not new. Uh, the Veterans Affairs Committee had several subcommittee hearings during the last Congress on, on the issue. But improvements within the program seem to be slow in coming. My subcommittee continues to frequently hear from SDV OSBs and their advocates regarding what should, be, what should be a straightforward process for veterans attempting to do business with the VA. While the verification process at CVE has improved and helped weed out some bad actors, it is abundantly clear that there is still a long road ahead. One topic discussed at length in the 112th Congress was VA's definition of ownership and control of small businesses. Despite the committees bringing this problem to VA's attention, VA's definition, definitions retain some key differences from, small from the Small Business Administration, and the effect of these differences has been a self-induced backlog of legitimate companies attempting to get certified through CVE and do business with the VA. 
The fact that VA's different interpretations of what constitutes ownership uh, mean, means that an individual could be recognized as a veteran small business owner with one government agency, but not with, um, not with a VA. Uh, and this should raise um, everyone's eyebrows. However, that's the reality that some veterans face today, including uh, service disabled veterans. SBA has had common sense requirements for what constitutes uh, an SDV OSB uh, in place for a long time. While VA's intent may be in the right place, its regulatory and interpretive actions have put many eligible veterans at a disadvantage. We still need to get this right. If we are going to enable our veterans who sacrifice for this country to do business with the federal, federal government, and if VA is going to set the standard for recognizing the commitment of these uh, same veterans, then a straightforward common sense process uh, needs to be in place. It is my sincere hope that down the road we are, we are not still discussing uh, the same issues. The time for conversation has passed and it is time to take action, fix the problem and move on. I understand that the system will never be perfect, nor is there one simple answer. However, after all, all the years that have passed since this program has been set up and the resources that have been added to CVE, it is reasonable to expect that we should be further along than we are today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And I'll yield to our ranking member, Ms. Moon, for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Hanna. Thank you to our witnesses for appearing before our subcommittees today. And thank you to all the veterans, especially the ones in this room today, for your wonderful service to our country. Uh, over the last century, brave Americans have fought in Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, Korea, and Europe for not only our freedom, but for the freedom of others. Over 635,000 men and women have died in these and many other wars. The surviving 22 million veterans include 5.5 million who were disabled while in the service. These courageous individuals deserve not only our enduring gratitude, but also the opportunity to build a new life after their many years of military service. One of the most important tools we have to accomplish this mission is the Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Business Procurement Program. In 2011, this initiative awarded more than 100,000 contracts worth over 11 billion to SDV small firms. However, these awards have accounted for only about 2.6% 2 2 of all federal contracts, below the 3% statutory goal. Efforts have been made to increase this level, but challenges still remain. Among the most pressing issues are the ongoing problems in verifying firms participating in this SDV program. Previously, GAO has found that non-SDV firms have won SDV contracts. This included front companies posing as veterans, pass-throughs, and outright fraud. As a result, millions of dollars were diverted away from legitimate service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. To prevent these abuses, GAO recommended that a verification system be implemented. But given the overlapping roles of both the SBA and the VA in administering this program, this reality has been slow to materialize. Regardless, we have to continue to make every effort to ensure that non-SDV firms cannot continue to steal these opportunities from service-disabled veteran firms. Given the recent sequester, it is now more important than ever to correct these flaws. This across-the-board cut will cause SDVs to lose out on more than 7,500 contracts worth more than $1 billion, making it critical that only eligible firms compete for the remaining opportunities. Addressing these failings and ensuring SDV procurement programs work as intended is long past due. With an unemployment rate of more than 11 percent for veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is essential that all veterans' resources are properly managed and overseen. Given that entrepreneurship remains a viable career path for many of our men and women, programs like the one this hearing is on today are critical to re reduce the high unemployment rate. I think I can speak for all of our subcommittee members here today in saying that we will do whatever it takes to help service disabled veterans overcome the challenges they face in today's economy. 
As a result, I'm glad that in addition to the federal agencies here with us today, that we're hearing directly from our veterans community. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you. I now yield to Ranking Member Ms. Kirkpatrick for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Hanna, and I want to thank all of the veterans who are here today <coughs> because you have already paid the price. We now must fight for you with all our might, uh, and I want you to know that we know that and we appreciate your being here today. In 1999, Congress required the Small Business Administration <coughs> to establish programs and services to help veterans make the transition from service member to small business owner by increasing federal contracting and subcontracting opportunities for veterans. As more veterans return home from Iraq and Afghanistan, our nation has the responsibility to help them re-enter civilian life. Some veterans may choose to go to school, work in the private and public sector, while others may choose to begin their business. Veterans bring with them self-discipline and a strong work ethic from their military service that we know will help them to succeed in any business. As we encourage veterans to enter into business with the federal government, we must have the right elements in place. It should not be overly difficult to do business with the federal government, but it should not be so easy that fraud is rampant and these opportunities that are set aside for veterans are lost. In 2010, the VA alone improperly awarded veteran, veterans set aside contracts valued at $500 million to ineligible businesses. The VA Inspector General stated that it expects VA to improperly award $2.5 billion in contracts over the next five years unless oversight and verification procedures are strengthened. In the end, what we should seek is a good balance of providing smart and worthwhile verification. But we should not make it so difficult as to prevent veterans from doing business with the VA and the rest of the federal government. Today's hearing will build upon the hearings from the last Congress as we seek to ensure that federal contracting is being done effectively and efficiently by the Small Business Administration and the Department of Veterans Affairs, particularly for service-disabled veterans, small business owners. As we explore what the definition of ownership and control from VA and SBA, along with other concerns, we should not lose sight that each business is the life of a veteran and the opportunity for a quality life for his or her family. I look forward to the testimony this morning, and I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If additional members have any opening statements prepared, I ask that they be submitted for the record. I also like to take a moment to explain the timing to you. Five minutes, uh, four minutes, the yellow light comes on, then the red light, but we will be lenient. Uh, as possible, if you could try to respect that time limit as best as possible. But we do want to hear what you have to say. Uh, with that, we have votes. I'm going to adjourn this, I would say, for 20 minutes. Um, we should be about that long, and uh, we'll be right back, and we'll continue. Thank you. Uh, the committee will uh, reconvene. In the interest in of time, I will read the uh, witnesses and their short bios. Our first witness today is Joe Wynn, who is testifying on behalf of Vet Force, a coalition of over 200 organizations and affiliates representing veterans nationwide. In addition to his work on executive committee of Vet Force, Mr. Wynn is the president of Vets Group Incorporated, a nonprofit organization that provides entrepreneurial education, federal procurement training, employment assistance, and other supportive services, primarily for veterans and people with disabilities or persons of limited means. He is also director of the legislative and li legislative liaison for the National Association for Black Veterans. A veteran himself, Mr. Wynn proudly served in the United States Air Force, and we thank you for your service, sir. Our second witness today is Davy Longhorn, Leghorn, excuse me, the assistant director for the Economic Division of American Legion. The American Legion Economic Division aims to ensure that veterans receive several opportunities for success upon exiting the military. Mr. Leghorn is a veteran, having proudly served in the United States military. We thank you for your service and for being here today, Mr. Leghorn. Our third witness is Mr. Mark Goldschmidt. 
founder and CEO of Goldschmidt, Goldschmidt and Associates, LLC, a service dis disabled veterans owned small business who has been involved with the CVE verification issue since its inception. Mr. Goldschmidt proudly served in the United States Navy. We thank you for your service and we thank you for your time today, Mr. Goldschmidt. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jonathan Williams. Mr. Williams is a partner with Polaro Matza here in DC, where he counsels businesses on a range of federal contracting issues, including the various small and minority business procurement programs. He has successfully tried cases at both the GAO and the Court of Federal Claims. Additionally, Mr. Williams has brought and defended numerous SBA protests and appeals pertaining to program eligibility. Welcome, Mr. Williams. You may begin, Mr. Wynn. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Hanna, Chairman Kaufman, ranking members and subcommittee members, fellow veterans and guests. On behalf of VBA National President John Rowan, its officers and members, and thousands of veteran business owners we represent, I thank you for taking the time to convene this very important hearing. In a recent report from the President's Interagency Task Force on Veterans Small Business Development, it was stated that two of America's greatest assets are the service of our returning veterans and the economic dynamism of our small businesses. We recognize that entrepreneurs and small businesses are the engines of American innovation and economic prosperity. But now that we have fallen over the fiscal cliff due to sequestration, federal agencies will be faced with significant budget cuts which will also impact the hiring of new employees. So we will have to turn to small businesses and the corporate sector to pick up the slack. Veterans own about 2.4 million businesses or 9 percent of all of America's businesses. These businesses generate about 1.2 trillion in receipts and employ nearly 5.8 million Americans. As highly trained professionals and leaders with experience in challenging environments, veterans' potential for successful entrepreneurship and small business ownership will not be fully achieved if the VA's regulations for verifying them as veteran business owners is allowed to become the standard throughout the federal marketplace. You would not think that the federal agency, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the very one created for those who have borne the battle, their widows and their orphans, would be the very agency that creates the greatest barriers and obstacles for thousands of veterans and business owners. Since the end of the Vietnam War, the VA has wrongfully denied thousands of veterans their claims for compensation for their service-connected injuries. And now, since 2008, the VA has once again been denying thousands of veteran business owners contracting opportunities due to their consistently inconsistent interpretations of VA and SBA contracting regulations. Over the past two years, the VA has reported more than 20,000 veteran business owners have applied for verification. Just over 6,000 are now approved. First, many veteran service disabled veteran business owners do not fully understand how they can be legally allowed to do business with other federal agencies, but not with the VA. Second, some applicants have problems with the CVE verification process and that doesn't mean that they're ignorant. I help support veterans and work with veterans, business owners, in going through the process, and it's still very lengthy to get through. Third, veterans are subjected to multiple contracting program rules. Uh, veterans, uh, there's a self-certifying rule within the federal marketplace, but some of those same businesses, uh, when it comes to doing business with the VA, they may, not, they may be denied. Fourth, an applicant may still be denied by the CVE reviewer based on their interpretation of sections of the regulation and or the documents submitted by the applicant. Here's some of the main reasons. Unconditional ownership, quorum restrictions, right of first refusal, community property laws, weighted voting requirement, dependence with other entities, control of strategic policy, higher officer position, day-to-day -day management, managerial experience. Basically, a veteran must be the majority owner, majority board member, majority stockholder, highest paid, hold the highest office, have the experience to manage the daily operations, make all the long-term decisions, must devote full time to the business, 
offer no right of first refusal, don't lease your office space or make loans from a non-vet, and by all means, don't live in a community property state. Without absolute proof of any one of these things, the veteran will likely be denied. In addition, not all veteran business owners are socially and economically disadvantaged, and definitely not all of them are women. So those two programs are statutorily different than the Service Disabled Vet Program. In concluding, I just would recommend that Congress should amend the uh, regulation in such a way to eliminate multiple interpretations of any sections. Congress should require that VA develop an appeals process that is independent of the same office that issued the denial. Congress should not consider extending the provisions to all federal agencies until a survey or a study has been done. And Congress should direct that study on how many legitimate businesses would also be denied if they used the, the existing CVE interpretation. <coughs> this concludes my statement, and I uh, look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. A few months ago, 20 full-time employees were laid off in Wisconsin when a service-disabled veteran-owned construction firm lost $1.7 million worth of work and the ability to bid on future contracts. This was due to VA's lengthy verification process. This is a real shame because the whole point of VA verification is to make these businesses eligible to compete for VA contracts. Chairman Hanna, Chairman Kaufman, Ranking Member Meng, and members of the subcommittees, on behalf of our National Commander, Jim Kautz, and the 2.4 million members of the American Legion, we thank you for this opportunity to testify at this joint hearing on the challenges facing veteran-owned and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. The bottom line is this. Many veterans find this process to be overly burdensome, distracting, and not worth the effort. The American Legion wants these businesses to be successful, not hamstrung, which is why we passed American Legion resolution titled Support Verification Improvements for Veterans' Businesses Within the Department of Veteran Affairs. To be clear, the American Legion supports verification. Government contracting officers are risk averse. They like certifications and they like it when a firm has been verified. The American Legion has been involved with VA verification since the program's inception. We participate in VA's verification assistant counseling program and we have worked with plenty of small business owners who have been denied verification. All too often we see businesses lose vital contracting opportunities due to the lengthy verification process. In some cases, businesses lose previously awarded contracts, resulting in layoffs and furloughs of their employees. The American Legion cannot stress enough how detrimental the current process can be to these veterans whose lives and family incomes are tied to their small businesses. The main challenge with the verification program seems to be VA's inability to strike the appropriate balance between the requisite government oversight to protect the integrity of the program and the impact and cost to veteran small businesses. Currently, to root out bad actors who maliciously seek to defraud the federal government, VA places a series of overzealous bright line rules to evaluate the applications. Most of these bright line rules apply to unconditional ownership and control requirements, and VA has formulated extreme interpretations that are unrealistic. The American Legion agrees with the U.S. Court of Federal Claims in their February 14, 2013 Miles ruling where the court applied the bankruptcy court's pragmatic definition that did not burden the veteran's ownership interest. We urge VA to adopt this pragmatic approach to evaluate ownership and control as practiced by the bankruptcy courts. Neglecting to adopt this approach, VA will continue to make this process punitive and burdensome to the majority of the firms seeking verification. The current backlog of initial applications and appeals will not diminish and veteran business owners will continue wasting large sums of money on attorney fees. One of the unintended consequences of VA's overzealous verification process is that established small businesses are, not, are choosing not to participate because the process is too burdensome and diverts their focus from running their businesses. So what you end up with 
are nascent businesses getting verified because it is easier for them to contort their operating agreements and bylaws to suit the current requirements for verification. VA then complains that they end up with too many inexperienced veteran business, businesses to draw from. On the other hand, we identify an unfair advantage with the larger small businesses who have, who have the personnel and resources to dedicate to the verification process. Should VA continue to deny the vast majority of the firms based on these control issues and permit the backlog to grow, the American Legion would certainly support a comprehensive and cooperative relationship between VA and SBA, whereby SBA would be the final arbiter of appeals. Finally, as highlighted within our written testimony, we are adamantly opposed to the six-month penalty wait time. In closing, the American Legion will continue to work with the SBA and VA to improve the verification process and to continue providing counseling service to our veteran entrepreneurs. I thank you again for the opportunity to bring the voice of veterans to this committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Leghorn. Mr. Goldschmidt. Thank you. I wish to thank the subcommittee chairman and the ranking members for holding this hearing today to address <coughs> The statutory, regulatory, and interpretive dis differences between SBA's Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Program and VA's Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business Program. As a verification assistance counselor and the subject matter expert for VetForce and the National Veteran Small Business Coalition, I have gained significant insights into CVE's issues. As a small business owner, I have tried to translate these issues into the cost and impact that they have on the veteran-owned business community. As a small business providing services to the federal government, the current environment provides significant challenges to profitability, growth, and survival. CVE's interpretations add additional arbitrary and unpredictable hurdles that make it more difficult for me to plan, finance, market, and operate my small business. These CVE interpretations tend to be more minimizing business reality and addressing more of the extremes. In business risk management, the fact that an event can happen is always accompanied by the probability of the occurrence and the impact of the occurrence, be it profit, growth, uh, cost, or schedule. For CVE, these impacts represent ownership and control. When CVE theorizes that an event might happen, they do a disservice to the veteran community, to the VA, and to the taxpayers by failing to ask a very simple question, so what? The net impact of those interpretations is as follows. Congress, through its laws passed for veterans, says that the intent to increase veteran business opportunities is not served by depriving vets of everyday business practices and therefore putting them at competitive disadvantage. CVE's risk avoidance program or approach has crippled legitimate veteran-owned businesses while doing little to prevent fraud. On VA's website, they have four businesses, one of which pled guilty, three of which were indictments, and during over a two-year period. During that same two-year period, I estimate about 4,500 companies were denied which represents more than an average of 10 for each of your districts that were legitimate businesses that were denied. The CVE verification program is becoming a de facto standard for other agencies. When I go to other agencies and I talk to them about small business, one of the first things they ask is, are you CVE verified? When I say yes, it's tell me more. When I watch businesses that say no, the almost immediate response is the body language that says, how do I get out of this conversation and get on to somebody that I want to talk to? Lastly, the documentation required by CVE is often considered excessive. Sometimes it's incomplete, and it's potentially subject to compromise. There are additional examples in my written testimony. I'd like to illustrate now from some examples CVE's findings that undermine business building and create veteran paranoia and distrust with the VA. These are recent cases. Uh, some of the ones that I have in my testimony have been resolved. But for example, Bravo 19 Construction is a New Jersey-based construction business. The owner 
is a combat wounded veteran rated 100 percent by the VA. On his 877 application, he indicated that he was a veteran, not a service-disabled veteran. Yet with his package, he submitted his letter from VA of a determination and a rating. Um, in spite of having clear proof that the individual was a service-disabled veteran, VA issued him with a veteran approval. Uh, Klaus Construction. Klaus is a uh, California-based remediation services company. They do large building demolition, including explosive bu building implosion and collapse, which requires a variety of NAICS codes to demonstrate compliance with environmental and other issues. Klaus is a small business with less than 100 employees. Its primary business, NAICS code, is a 500 employee standard. CVE denied Klaus based upon a separate NAICS code, which was arbitrarily picked, as the primary NAICS code in the SAM system was their 500 employee NAICS code. When this error was pointed out to CVE, who, by the way, had the payroll from the company and could have counted the number of employees, their response was to refer the company to SBA for a formal size determination. As we look at these and other examples from my written testimony, we see that major corrective actions are interpretive and therefore can be immediately implemented. This was a result in fewer denials and a significant reduction in effort and cost for both CVE and the veteran community. I provided some statutory, regulatory, and interpretive suggestions in my written testimony. That concludes my oral testimony, and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Mr. Goldschmidt. Mr. Williams. Good afternoon, Chairman Kaufman, Chairman Hanna, other distinguished members of the subcommittees. My name is Jonathan Williams. I'm a partner with the law firm Polero Massa, uh, which represents veterans in their dealings with small businesses, uh, with the Small Business Administration and the VA. It's an honor to be here today to share my experiences representing SDVOSBs. I'm a strong proponent of the SDVOSB programs administered by the SBA and the VA, and I've seen firsthand how these programs have benefited many veterans. However, I've also seen many veterans struggle to obtain the benefits of the programs for a variety of preventable reasons. My testimony will address those problems, which I believe stem from two primary causes. First, the VA's application process is too long and cumbersome. Second, the rules governing the two SDVOSB programs are confusing and inconsistent. Regarding the application process at the VA, the VA generally takes a deny first, ask questions later approach. As a result, most veterans do not learn of problems with their application until they receive a denial letter. This approach forces veterans to fix the application errors and then file a request for reconsideration. Of the requests for reconsideration we have handled, more than half could have been avoided if the VA had notified the veteran of minor issues before denying the application. Not surprisingly, the VA has struggled to process requests for reconsideration due to volume. The VA has acknowledged that the process needs improvement and recently proposed an initial screening stage to help veterans address simple issues before their application is denied. The initial screening stage is a step in the right direction. The VA could improve the application process further by providing all bases for denial in the initial denial letter. We have worked with a number of veterans who were initially denied for one reason, addressed that issue on reconsideration, only to then be denied again for new reasons the VA had not previously identified. Requiring veterans to endure multiple rounds of reconsideration is frustrating, not to mention very costly and time consuming. Many veterans perceive the application process at the VA to be adversarial. These veterans believe the VA personnel are looking for a reason to keep them out rather than trying to help them to get in. Given that the VA's program was enacted to assist veterans in the transition from active duty to civilian life, making veterans feel more welcomed into the program should be a priority. Turning to the second root cause of the challenges veterans have faced, the two SDVOSB programs are often inconsistent. The inconsistencies stem from the separate rules used by the SBA and the VA. 
though similar, the two sets of rules differ in many respects, and this has caused a lot of confusion amongst veterans as well as government personnel. For example, both agencies have interpreted their rules to prohibit restrictions on the transfers of the veteran's ownership in his company. Recently, the Court of Federal Claims rejected the VA's interpretation and held that the VA's rules permit commercially reasonable transfer restrictions. This was an important business-friendly ruling because transfer restrictions make it easier for veterans to attract investors. However, the Court's ruling only applies to the VA's program. The SBA should revisit its position on transfer restrictions to avoid inconsistency between the two agencies on this issue. The two programs are also inconsistent regarding joint ventures. Joint ventures are a valuable tool through which small businesses can work together to access contracts they would not have been able to perform on their own. The SBA's rules make it easier for veterans to take advantage of joint ventures. The VA, on the other hand, requires veterans to go through a second application process for the joint venture. This practice requires additional time and resources that many veterans do not have, and it is arguably contrary to the VA's rules. If the VA handled joint ventures similar to the SBA, joint ventures would be a much more useful tool for veterans who work with the VA. Another point of confusion is over which agency should decide small business status. The VA's statute indicates the definition of a small business comes from the Small Business Act, which the SBA is entrusted to implement. Furthermore, the VA's acquisition regulation recognizes that all protests pertaining to the size of SDVOSBs should be sent to the SBA. Yet, the VA's rules permit the VA to deny an applicant based on size and affiliation concerns, even if the SBA has not been consulted. This trend should be stopped because it is inconsistent with the VA's statutory mandate and infringes on the SBA's role as the arbiter of small business status. To solve some of the regulatory inconsistencies in the short term, the VA and the SBA could change their interpretations of the existing rules. However, the best long-term solution would be to consolidate the two programs into one, with one set of rules and one agency to interpret those rules. Though by no means an easy task, consolidation of the two programs would be much simpler and more efficient for veterans and the government. That concludes my testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you here today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I understand that the VA appellate process takes about 147 days and is not heard by administrative judges, whereas the SBA's appeal process takes roughly 15 days and does result in a published decision from an administrative judge. Knowing that and knowing what we've heard today, and I know your opinion, Mr. Williams, I'll, I'll ask the question that Mr. Williams just gave his opinion on. Do you believe that this should be consolidated into one program? And do you believe, all three of you, that that should be the SBA or do you have something else in mind? One of the recommendations I made is that the programs use a common adjudication of uh, SBA's OHA to get a common set of rules, or at least a common set of adjudication and case law that can be worked from. So yes, I would agree with that. The American Legion is a resolution-based organization. We currently do not have a resolution on this matter, but our resolution does state that we would like to streamline the process. And if it does take uh, interference from SBA to be the final arbiter, we, we can get behind this. Uh, just a follow-up comment on that. Um, it's, uh, it's our opinion, too, that um, it's getting to the point where it seems like SBA would probably have more experience in handling the appeals process. There seems to be no real appeals process at the VA, as I mentioned in, in uh, my testimony. Um, the same folks that are doing the denial are also the ones you have to go back to if you have a problem. So an independent body uh, and perhaps with the SBA, that may be the solution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Goldsmith, VA says that they do $3 billion in veteran-owned small business contracts. Uh, so why should they um, care about these issues? Mr. Coffin, I think that there are several reasons they should look at that. 
Um, the issues that we are looking at that are the adjudications by CVE create inefficiencies uh, that cause a lot of cost, a lot of heartache to some of the small businesses. The impact of that is that there are fewer small businesses that can compete for business um, within the VA. Recently, they have had a number of denials of apparent awardees for contracts. These are the folks that made it through the contract um, program and were picked as the best, the best value to the government. And because of typically the rules that were discussed by uh, Mr. Wynn and Mr. Leghorn about some of the simple things that could have been changed, they lost opportunities and VA lost the best of the best in those opportunities. The other is a number of successful businesses, because of the hurdles that are there by VA, choose to do business in other locations or other agencies within the government. So consequently, the VA doesn't necessarily get all of the best. So they are artificially limiting competition within VA, not getting the best results in some cases based upon their evaluations. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Leghorn, uh, given the Legion's own review of some of the issues regarding regulations, can you speak to CVE's lack of the use of, of CFR 13 Section 121 and its impact on uh, their decisions? Uh, currently, I think um, VA has not adopted or reconciled uh, 38 CFR. 74 with 13 CFR 121. If VA is going to move forward and make determinations on size uh, el eligibility, then they should uh, adopt that section. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wynn, uh, what are your recommendations um, for, for striking a balance between preventing continuing fraud and loosening the restrictions uh, so SDV always Bs are not overburdened in the verification process? Well, we, we don't want a program that is going to allow uh, companies that uh, misrepresent themselves to participate in that program. We definitely don't agree with that. But again, we still don't want a program that is so overly burdensome and complex that it screens out thousands of legitimate owned businesses. So it may be uh, necessary to have more, uh, to be more vigilant on the back end. That means after uh, companies are admitted into the program, to provide more uh, oversight and monitoring on a constant basis. We have had um, reports where uh, companies that have been identified as misrepresenting themselves were allowed to still get additional contracts later. So hopefully, you know, more could be done after companies are in the program as opposed to doing so much more to screen them out from getting in. Thank you. I yield back. Ms. Bank, Ranking Member Bank. Thank you. Mr. Leghorn, in your testimony, you discuss how VA has said that 98 percent of businesses who are denied certification are not maliciously trying to defraud the government, but rather there is an ignorance of the law. Um, do you believe that VA is doing enough to educate the businesses on the requirements for CV verification, and how can the VA do a better job? Well, I, I think actually VA does a very good job with the counseling program and everything that they have on their website to get the information out. Um, it, but but it's just a matter of outreach that has to be ramped up a lot more in in order to. Um, get the veteran entrepreneurs to know about the common pitfalls and how they can avoid them. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Takano. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, I want to just review some of your testimony. You stated that uh, that there is a, a uh, deny first, ask questions later policy that apparently is used by uh, this VA program. Um, and you are saying that also that uh, uh, veteran business owners uh, uh, don't often know uh, how to correct their, their applications uh, if, if they were told in advance and then they find new 
even after they make the correction, they often find new reasons. Um, how often does this occur? Uh, is this, I mean, I want to get a sense of how widespread. Yeah, we see it very frequently. The, the, the deny first, ask questions later a, a approach has been pretty consistent uh, for the last year and a half or so since the number of applications really shot up uh, in, in mid-2011. Uh, I, I would say the vast majority of cases, there was little or no dialogue between the VA and the applicant before the denial was issued. Now, we've seen some improvement in 2012, particularly with respect to requests for reconsideration, and some of those are handled by the VA's Office of General Counsel, and we've had good success with those folks in, in dialoguing and, and, and having a back and forth about issues and trying to reach a common ground. But uh, for the most part, when a, when a firm comes to us and they've been denied, they haven't had any exchange with the VA to that point. So they're having to confront this issue for the first time, having already been denied from the program. And the, the second point you raised is that once they don't necessarily have to tell you every reason they're denying you in that initial denial letter. So what we've started to do is to ask the veteran to send us all of their documents, the entire application, even if it was denied for one needle in the haystack. We ask them to send us everything. And then we do a full review to, to see what else might they be denied for three months from now, six months from now. And you can imagine that's a very time-consuming and costly uh, exercise for veterans to go through, many of whom can't afford to go through it. Um, but that, that's a, a symptom of the fact that they don't have to tell you every reason up front, and they will oftentimes cite different reasons three or four months after you correct the initial reason. Um, you, none of you may be able to answer this question, but I'm, I'm trying to understand what might be the explanation for this stance. I mean, was there something in the history of the VA uh, in this program where there were uh, cases of fraud that may have caused this overly cautious behavior? I mean, do, do, do you have any, th is there any speculation or? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's overly cautious so much as it is that they, um, they're, they're not looking at everything before they issued the denial. I, I, I suspect that a lot of times what happens is you get to the first document and you see a problem and you put it in the no pile. And then they come back and they, they fix that, but then, then, then you start to look at the rest of the application. <coughs> And you, and you realize that there are other problems. I, I don't know that that's happening, but I, I suspect that may have uh, been part of the issue. Uh, is, is it a staffing issue or, or a staff training issue? Um, well, or is it just a kind of a philosophy of the, of the, of the way the I don't works? know. I would, I would, uh, I would imagine that certainly there, there must be a resources or a staffing component to that, the, that you look for uh, you know, the, the, the quickest way to move through some of the applications, and if it can be denied based on, on one issue that you spot right off the bat, you go ahead and, and, and get it moving through the system. Um, you know, the VA has recently indicated that they plan to in institute an initial screening stage. So they will try to screen applications for these uh, issues in corporate records that tend to trip people up and give the applicants an opportunity to correct those issues before their application is denied. And that, that's a really positive step. It's something that we've been hoping that they would do. Uh, you know, the proof will be the pudding in, in terms of how that works and whether or not it just becomes an, another hoop that they, the veterans have to jump through. But that should reduce the number of reconsideration requests and the amount of time it takes to get through the reconsideration process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Bentivoglio. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Hanna and Chairman Kaufman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. This holds some personal significance for me. I am a small business owner, or was before I came to Congress, and I'm also a service disabled veteran. Uh, so the policy we are discussing today affects me directly. And that said, of course, I come with no selfish intent, but rather to serve the interests of my two million fellow service-disabled veterans and their families. I'm also a member of the American Legion and a life member of the VFW. Um, but I just recently got this this morning, so I, um, I've dealt with the VA, uh, and this is the first time I've heard that the VA actually will help a small businessman. Um, I may be naive. But um, I, and I've, uh, since this morning, become very acquainted with this. 
and some of the questions we're going to ask and some of your testimony I've read over. But help me walk through this system because I have, um, I've dealt with the VA as a Vietnam veteran and never wanted to go back. And then as a uh, veteran from Iraq, I found it was a whole different thing. So I'd like to ask you a question. Can you walk me through this as how I would go about or a fellow veteran in my district who wants to start his own business, his first step to go into the VA, does he have to put together a business plan or is the application process similar to that in the format? The business plan is not a requirement of verification, but the business documentation that addresses governance, ownership, et cetera, is part of that process. So the documentation that I would put together, uh, if I'm going through as a small business coming into the government, would be all of the small business steps of registering with Dun & Bradstreet, registering in SAM, uh, putting my information in. Um, and from a VA perspective, I'd be putting together my paperwork that addresses my service disability, or th which they probably have in their system. But I would be putting together all of the paperwork on my company, uh, including you know, all of the registration with the state, um, my operating agreement or bylaws, um, a variety of information, including licenses. Um, so let, let me see if I understand this. I don't have to, if I was a veteran, I wouldn't have to come in, give you a marketing or a, um, a, uh, a business plan or a marketing plan addendum to that or give you what I project my next three years of income is or in my uh, my expenditures, how I'm going to do this business. I don't have to do that? No. Okay. So the next thing is, who um, who are those people that actually review my application? Do they have any business experience, or are they uh, government clerks that determine that? I don't know what business experience they have, but it's a mix of government and contractors. I think that's, that would be a better question for Mr. Lenny to talk about the okay. mix of the folks. Right. Um, but in my experience, they have not been business owners or business managers. Interesting. Okay. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Walls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming and helping us understand this. Uh, these are important programs, and when they work, I think most of you hearing that they, they, they are important and they do work. When they don't, they're incredibly frustrating. And uh, I, I just, this might give a heads up for that panel that's sitting behind you. I'm going to get a little bit parochial here on this, but this is a letter I got last night. I'm going to just ask you as you listen to this paragraph, I think this is typical or an anomaly. We went through the recertification process last summer and sat through the six-week outage on the registration site. We then submitted the final documents immediately after the outage ended, and we got notification that we had reached the determination stage. Then within a short, few short weeks, we were shown on the website as certified, SDVOSB, problem solved. Then last Wednesday, last Wednesday, we got the attached letter saying our certification had expired and we're out of the program. At this point, it appears they lost their materials and pushed us out of the database. Typical or anomaly, in your opinion, as you see this? I would not call that typical, but I would not call that an anomaly because I'm seeing that with an increasing frequency. Okay. It, it's not. Have you heard of these types of things happening? Yes. I, now I, keep in mind, this is a 20-year-old business that's gone through this, been all there. Why are we wasting time on this? Nothing has changed. They went through the process. They followed it. They did it. And then you told them, and they went ahead forward. With the folks sitting behind you are going to hear this. Why would they? This is the frustration I feel. I mean, if the process was working, they got certified, we should have been able to move on. And now we're going to deal with this one. Did it, did you hear these stories? Yes, we do a lot. That, that, email, this, that email sounded very similar. Yeah, in your opinion, why did this happen? Um, well, they did, they did have technological issues with the system last summer. We, we heard from a lot of folks who were disappeared out of the VetBiz database last year. For the folks sitting behind, I'm going to come back after these votes. It's Windsor Software. Somebody might get on the phone. Good, but yeah. So we hear that? Mm -hmm. So so now I got a veteran, small business, service disabled veteran, following the rules, doing it, proud to have the symbol up on their website, doing these things, and they got booted out. What's their recourse now other than writing to me before they knew there was a hearing? What was their recourse to go back through and get back on again? Well, there's an appeal process. Uh, if, if their eligibility is uh, rescinded, they could file an appeal. Uh, ultimately, that, that would be with the agency, with the VA. Uh, ultimately, they could go to federal court. For small business. Right. Who was already certified. Correct. Told they were. Kicked off. 
So it seems to me, and I'll, I'll yield back to the chairman here in just a second, it, it seems to me is that I heard you, uh, Mr. Goldsman, you made this point about it is, is that we do this all too often, that the, the proof always lays on the veteran. The assumption is they're wrong. We, we process it from that point of view, and we ask them to prove they're right. So now I've got a small business doing everything right, going to have to go back through this process to prove that they have been certified 19 times in a row, and you have to get recertified. So the way to fix this, anybody got a... Got a suggestion? Well, they extended the, the amount of time that you're eligible from before you have to re-verify from one year to two years. Um, so I'm not sure where this particular company fell uh, in that spectrum, but you know, perhaps extending it further. Okay. Anybody else? I'd just like to say it's, it's um, far too many businesses that have been denied for various reasons. And the thing about it, as you mentioned, a 20-year uh, uh, business, a company that had been doing business for 20 years, we have seen a number of businesses that are out here doing business with federal agencies, perfectly legitimate businesses, only to get denied to do business at the VA. Statistically, so, what's the chance that this is a fraudulent claim versus an error that was made on them? It, the, the chances are that this was an error. Am I correct? It could be a fraudulent claim. I, I don't know. I'm going to find out from the folks behind you. But statistically, so everybody gets kicked out. Now it's, they have to go back and prove that they're legitimate. Well, it's been stated um, by the VA small business director and even in some of the GAO reports that less than 2 percent of those companies that were denied were denied for reasons of fraud. Okay. Yeah. I yield back. I'll wait for the next panel, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. If there are no further questions from any, any members of this panel, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have to go vote. So I'll dismiss this panel when we come back. Uh, Mr. Kaufman will take over the gavel and handle the second panel. Um, so we're going to have votes. I'll reconvene probably 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Committee's now called back to order. Our first witness on the second panel is Beer, Bill Shear, Director of the Financial Markets and Community Investment Team of the Government Accountability Office. Mr. Shear frequently comes before both committees, and we look forward to hearing your testimony again today. You are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Kaufman and Hannah, Ranking Members Meng and Kirkpatrick, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to discuss the Department of Veterans Affairs efforts to verify the eligibility of veteran-owned small businesses, including service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, to receive contracting preferences under VA's Veterans First Contracting Program. This statement is based on our January 2013 report on VA's verification program. Given the status of VA's verification procedures and operations, our work focused on issues related to planning for and designing the verification program and on changes in the program's management and operations. My testimony today addresses, first, the progress that VA has made in ensuring that its program verifies eligibility on a timely and consistent basis, and second, key operational and policy issues that VA will have to address if its verification program is expanded to support the government-wide service-disabled veteran-owned small business contracting program. In summary, the two key findings from our January 2013 report are, first, VA has instituted a number of significant changes to its verification processes to improve and address program weaknesses but it continues to face challenges in its efforts to establish a stable and efficient program to verify firms on a timely and consistent basis. These challenges are directly related to shortcomings in strategic planning and data systems for the verification program. Second, expanding VA's verification program to support the government-wide service-disabled veteran-owned small business contracting program would require VA to improve its verification process and address a number of operational and policy issues. To improve the management oversight of VA's verification program, our January 2013 report made two recommendations addressing strategic planning and data systems needs. VA concurred with the two recommendations and stated it had actions underway that would address them. 
Chairman Hanna and Kaufman, and Ranking Members Mang and Kirkpatrick. This concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Our next uh, witness is, uh, is John Shoraka, uh, the Associate, Associate Administer, Administrator of Government Contracting and Business Development at the Small Business Administration. Uh, in this capacity, he is responsible for ensuring maximum participation by small firms across the Federal marketplace and overseeing all government contract programs benefiting small businesses. Thank you for uh, being with us today, and you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Kaufman and Hannah, Ranking Members Kirkpatrick and Mend, and members of the subcommittees, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. The SBA plays a pivotal role in helping veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses, or SDVOs, obtain access to Federal contracts. As you know, veteran-owned businesses are an integral part of our nation's economy and its ongoing recovery. Veterans own 2.4 million um, about 2.4 million, or 9 percent, of U.S. businesses. These businesses generate about 1.2 trillion in receipts and employ nearly 6 million Americans. One key sector of the veteran small business economy is government contracting, where SBA and its SDVO program play a critical role. Our SDVO program provides Federal procuring agencies with the authority to set acquisitions aside for exclusive competition by SDVOs. The program also gives procuring agencies the authority to make sole source awards to SDVOs if certain conditions are met. SBA's government-wide program, along with the VA's Veteran First Contracting Program, are intended to assist the Federal Government in meeting the statutorily established annual agency-wide goal of awarding at least 3 percent of the total value of contract dollars to SDVOs. In fiscal year 2011, over $11.8 billion in contracts went to SDVOs, up by 3.8 percent over the previous year. To qualify as an SDVO under SBA's statutory guidelines, a firm must meet four conditions through a self-certification process. First, the firm must be at least 51 percent owned by one or more service-disabled veterans. Second, the firm's management must be controlled by one or more service-disabled veterans or, in the case of a veteran with a permanent and severe disability, by the spouse or the permanent caregiver of the disabled veteran. Third, the firm must meet the small business size standard for any Federal contract they bid on. And fourth, the firm must self-represent their sta uh, disabled veteran status. Currently, there are approximately 12,000 self-certified SDVOs in the System for Award Management, which is the government-wide contracting database. In terms of a participant's status as a veteran with a service-connected disability, the owner-operator of an SDVO must be able to produce official documentation that he or she has a service-connected disability in the event of a protest. A protest occurs when a competing bidder or other interested party challenges the winning firm's eligibility as an SDVO. The initial decision on a protest is made by my office. The determination of a protest may be appealed to SBA's Office of Hearing and Appeals, or OHA. OHA provides independent administrative appellate review of SBA program determinations, including the initial SDVO determinations made by my office. OHA decisions, in turn, may be appealed to the Federal courts. Currently, OHA is staffed by eight full-time employees, including two administrative judges, who decide appeals of the, government, uh, of the Office of Government Contracting's initial SDVO determinations. In FY 2012, OHA decided eight SDVO appeals, roughly 20 percent of GCBD's 41 initial determinations that year. We use the protest process to help root out fraud, waste, and abuse in our small business programs. By referring questionable firms to our general counsel department official or SBA's inspector general for further investigation. In FY 2012, SBA suspended, proposed for debarment, or debarred 30 firms or individuals involved in procurement related misconduct. The SBA and VA mutually recognize the importance of the SDBO communities to the American economy. SBA and VA have collaborated to compare our programs in an effort to bring them into closer alignment and provide better service to the veterans community. While there are similarities, there are also key differences. 
For instance, VA's Veteran First Program is a certification program very similar to SBA's 8A Business Development Program, while the government-wide SDVO program uses self-certification. In order to meet the requirements of a certification program, a firm must provide more initial information and work through the certifi certification process to meet eligibility requirements. Another difference between the SBA and VA program is in the timing of requests for documentation and the review of documentation to dis demonstrate program eligibility. In a protest-based self-certification program, the requests for additional documentations are submitted in response to a protest that is filed after a firm has been identified as the apparent successful offeror. Once the documentation is received, a determination of, of eligibility is made. The VA certification process requires that documentation be submitted and a determination be made before an offer can be submitted or a contract be awarded. Our collaboration with the VA has been productive in identifying other areas of potential coordination and best practice sharing. I would be happy to discuss these efforts or any of the topics the subcommittees wish to explore during the question and answer portion of the hearing today. Thank you once again for your support of our work in this area and for the opportunity for me to appear in front of you today. Our final witness, our final witness is Tom uh, Lenny, uh, Executive Director for uh, Small and Veteran uh, Business Programs within the Office of Small and Disadvantaged uh, Business Utilization uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, in this capacity, he is responsible for promoting small business participation at VA with a particular focus on service-disabled, veteran-owned small, business, small businesses and veteran-owned uh, and, and, um, veteran small-disabled businesses. Uh, as we have noted uh, several times today, many of our distinguished witnesses are veterans, including uh, uh, Mr. Lenny. Uh, who proudly served in the United States Army. We thank you for your service and look forward to your testimony. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, Anna, and Chairman Kaufman. Uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify. Last year, the veteran, VA Veterans First Program enabled veteran-owned small businesses to receive contract awards totaling more than $3.8 billion from the VA. Since its inception, the VA verification program has faced challenges balancing the need to prevent in ineligible firms from taking improper advantage of the Veterans First program with our desire to make the process easier and faster for legitimate veteran-owned small businesses. The VA has made substantial progress on both fronts. In the aftermath of reports in 2011 from the VA Inspector General and the Government Accountability Office, our imperative was to ensure that all firms in the program had been properly verified as meeting the standards laid out in 38 CFR 74. We have addressed all the recommendations in these reports. Indeed, in this latest report, the GAO acknowledged, as Bill did here today, Mr. Shears did here today, improvements. As we improve the verification process, however, we realize that many of the remaining issues are associated with the rules themselves. Although the regulation that governs VA's verific verification program was derived from the SBA regulations that uh, cover the government-wide SDVOSB program and the Section 8A Business Development Program, there has existed in the stakeholder community a widespread misconception that there are major differences between the VA and the SBA regulations. To understand what differences truly exist, VA collaborated with the SBA over the last several months to conduct a thorough comparison of the ownership and control portions of our respective regulations. Our analysis revealed two statutory differences. Two re and two regulatory differences. We also compared VA's interpretation of the regulation to the SBA interpretations. As reflected in the SBA status protests and in the OHA decisions uh, over the past two years, and found a single instance where our interpretation differed from the SBA's, and we are changing our interpretation to match theirs. Uh, although VA seeks to align its interpretation with the SBA, we have determined that transfer restrictions on ownership that are part of normal commercial dealings, such as the right of first refusal, do not materially affect the ability of a veteran to unconditionally own or control the business. Therefore, VA will no longer interpret the current regulation to mean that such restrictions constitute a reason for denying eligibility. Since many rules issues cannot be resolved by reinterpretation, 
the VA has initiated a formal process to consider changes based on lessons learned and outreach to a broad range of veteran stakeholders. We have received a number of recommendations worthy of consideration. However, in view of the current alignment with SBA rules, any consideration of changes to the VA verification program will involve, involve coordination with the SBA. Our goal is to increase opportunities for veteran businesses. Our analysis has revealed that most applicants fail because they do not fully understand the regulation. To address this problem, we will expand our verification assistance program by adding pre-application workshops to the three existing elements, which consists of an online self-assessment tool that walks the veteran through every element of the regulation, verification assistance briefs, 11 of which are on our website and cover about 85 percent of the reasons for denial, and partnerships to provide counseling services to applicants. Three of our counselors were present in the first panel, the only one that was not a counselor. We don't allow for-profit organizations to partner with us on counseling. In May, we will adopt the practice of a contacting an applicant with preliminary findings where there are issues of noncompliance that can be easily and quickly corrected. We will allow applicants to make corrections prior to initial determination. We are currently running some limited pilots to validate the process and to train the CVE staff. The most recent GAO report found that management information systems supporting verification is woefully inadequate for our purpose. To solve this problem, VA has a next generation system under development. We expect to award a contract for the new system in May with an initial operational capability in October 2013. In conclusion, we have overcome many of the challenges and vulnerabilities that were raised by the GAO and OIG reports, and improved processes have reduced the average time to initial determination from more than 130 days during the summer of 2011 to fewer than 40 days for those applicants that were applications that were completed last month. We continue to improve our processes and will revise our regulation in coordination with the SBA to achieve a, a program that enables real veterans to gain expanded access to real opportunities with the Department of Veteran Affairs. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittees, this concludes my statement. I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shorka, how could the Veterans Administration better apply the interpretive standards of uh, 121 to ensure they uh, are in sync with the Small Business Administration? With regards to size, uh, the SBA uh, is the agency that makes determinations on size on any given one contract, on contract-specific determinations. So when there is a protest at a uh, time when there is a uh, contract being awarded, the SBA is the agency that will make that determination. What we often find uh, that happens, since the determination at the VA is made uh, during the certification process, the primary NAICS code for that entity is used to determine size and their eligibility to the program. However, if it is contract specific, the contract NAICS code will be used, and that is where you will have a divergence in an entity being found small at um, certification and potentially other than small in a protest situation. Okay. Mr. Scheer, um, why wasn't the Government Accounting Office uh, able to determine whether the recent changes have been affected, effective? Part of the reason why we stepped back and looked at strategic planning is that we observed that there wasn't a stable uh, process in place where we could do testing and evaluate how well a stable process was being established. So the first thing was the progress, or in this case, the lack of progress at VA affected very much what our audit work uh, included. One of the things that we have recommended which we think is very important going forward for VA is that part of their strategic planning is to have some type of a feedback mechanism and performance metrics around the idea that from its audits of its own, of its own evaluations and determinations of basically how many, how, how well those determinations were being determined. And so there just isn't that VA started collecting some information on that last fall, but really we need a system in place and VA needs a system in place to try to test 
how well its process is working. So you don't have a feel right now as to whether or not they're, they're working uh, as the program was in, together as the program was intended? We don't have evidence that's working as intended. And among the other things is we've heard uh, similar types of concerns as raised by the first panel. We reached out to these constituencies uh, that represent service disabled veterans. And we know there's a lot of concerns out there and there's a lack of metrics to really evaluate how well VA's process is working with the changes that have recently been made. We'll do a second round of questions. Uh, uh, so let me, um, Mr. Hanna. Mr. Scherer, uh, I'd suggest to you that we have plenty of evidence that it's not working. We had a panel just before that gave us a, a litany of, of, of examples, and I'm sure they have many more. Um, Mr. Shiraka, in the GAO report uh, you discussed today, you mentioned the statutory uh, procedural and interpretive differences between the SBA and the VA programs. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, can you explain what these perceived differences are specifically, uh, the key differences in, in your interpretation, rather than that more or less subjective phrase? Are there sure. There, I mean, when you compare the rules and the regulations, there are some specific uh, minor differences, and I think Mr. Lenny mentioned, or someone today mentioned, with regards to spouses uh, uh, of deceived uh, or deceased uh, service disabled members being able to uh, control and run the company after uh, the passing. Uh, and that is one difference. But where we see significant sort of divergence is not necessarily in, in the rules themselves, but in the interpretations. The SBA doesn't uh, have bright line. Uh, determinations or bright line uh, uh, guidelines with respect to, as an example, um, uh, board control. Um, we look at the entirety of the case to determine uh, where control and ownership resides. If you look at board control as an example, state by state there's different rules and regulations around how the uh, board determines quorum, et cetera. Those have to be taken into consideration to determine if indeed the veteran owns small business or the veteran owns and controls uh, the firm. Another area I think that was mentioned was uh, rights of transfer. Um, that is not a bright line for us. Depending on what the uh, uh, common business practice is, that has to be evaluated based on the totality of the circumstances to determine if it indeed affects ownership and control of the firm. Thank you. Mr. Lenny, you run the Center for Veterans Enterprise and the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at the VA. Uh, given that Section 15K of the Small Business Act specifically directs that director of the small, uh, of Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization shall carry out exclusively the duties of enumerated in this act and shall, while the director, not hold any other title, position, or responsibility except as necessary to carry out carry out responsibilities under sec Section 15K. How, how do you comply with that Small Business Act? Can you uh, be the advocate for service disabled veterans owned small business at the same time um, you're tasked with verification, with all due respect? Uh, yes, sir. I can do both because the act of verifying veteran owned small business has enabled uh, 5,400 veteran-owned small businesses to participate in a program that did, has distributed more than $3.8 billion in procurement dollars to veteran-owned small businesses. Mm -hmm. So I think that this program has, that, that the VA has established has created a gold standard and that in the federal government, when people know that a firm has been verified by the VA, they can take it to the bank. And the results, this is real money to real vets and it's a program that benefits veterans. And there's 5,400 firms in this program that get those benefits. So I, don't, I personally don't have any issue with mm -hmm. a uh, conflict of interest because oh, we're you. helping vets. Uh, can you show us where in the statute it's permitted? Maybe you can get back to us. I don't want uh, I, I think uh, that's an important question, and uh, to give you a complete answer, let me provide that. Sure, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Shrek, I want, one, has it ever occurred to you that beyond verification of the veterans, uh, you don't need the VA? 
that you're perfectly capable as a small business administration of doing this as you do everywhere in the country? Sure. Uh, I know you don't have the budget for it, but the VA does, right? $30 million. Uh, what do you think of that? Well, uh, statutorily, the VA has an important um, program uh, to make sure that uh, a portion of their contracts, their Vet First contracts, go specifically to the service disabled community. Uh, I think that is an important program that has helped us meet our goals, uh, or I shouldn't say meet our goals, get closer and closer to our goals over the years. As I mentioned, we had an improvement of 3.8 um, percent over from 2010 to 2011. Uh, w what I can say is that our self-certification program for the service disabled community for the rest of the Federal Government, uh, in our view, has been effective in self-policing itself. Uh, over the last three years, we have had more uh, suspensions and demarments than the previous decade. Um, it has been a, a system where uh, interested parties, including other vendors or even the contracting officer, can initiate a protest, in which case we get involved to make sure that the uh, firm is indeed service disabled. It just seems like so many of the problems are a function of disagreements and in interpretation that if everything went one place, and, uh, and when you look at the way you are organized and how much more efficient, relatively efficient you seem to be, at least uh, historically, uh, it's, uh, I hope you appreciate it is a fair question. I yield back, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Waltz, uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to first uh, thank uh, both the Chairman and the Ranking Members on this. It is not often that we combine uh, areas of jurisdiction together, and we will oftentimes sit in our committee and criticize the lack of collaboration between agencies while we are not collaborating. They did not make that mistake, and they brought you here, and I thank that. Uh, Mr. Linney, I would also like to publicly thank you and your staff for addressing the concern of my constituent in a timely, professional manner that allows us to give an answer. And uh, I am grateful for that. And uh, next time I will just come to you so I don't have to do it publicly. So I appreciate and apologize to you for that. But uh, I am grateful for it. Mr. Scheer, maybe you can help me with this. It is not incompatible, is it, for us to figure out how to, how to streamline this process and still keep uh, the checks and balances on fraud in place? Would it be your opinion we can do both? There is a trade-off. And the two have to be balanced. And I think VA is still searching for a balance in terms of its policies and procedures. So the idea there, when we look at internal controls, we look at whether there is reasonable uh, uh, assurance that only eligible firms will participate. And there is room within that to come, up with, to come up with rules and procedures that can help to fight fraud while still allowing legitimate firms to participate in this marketplace. And I will. Uh, I, I was at that hearing in 2011. We did it. And I think we should acknowledge progress has been made. But I still think we are trying to fight this. And I struggle with this one always, whether it was uh, Department of Labor and, and Vets Jobs issues with the VA. I, I am somewhat biased where I tend to fall on the VA side of things as one-stop shopping. But I also recognize the expertise that is here. Um, does it make sense that these two agencies should partner, in your opinion? Is, is that the best way to ensure delivery of services to these these veteran-owned businesses and the fraud and, and, and protect against fraud? The collaboration and the cooperation that we are at least are observing at recently between the two agencies we view in a very positive sense. We view it as a positive sense in the broader picture that you know, the President has identified a cross-cutting priority goal to serve small businesses and, and uh, entrepreneurs. We see it in that framework. We see it in a more detailed framework in terms of what these agencies can bring to each other. For example, SBA has been working for roughly the last two or three years in developing a new uh, data system to manage its 8A and its hub zone programs. And now there's starting to be some collaboration between the agencies to see how could this system uh, help inform or even directly help VA deal with what is a very huge challenge that it has to have a data verification system that really can work for what its mission is. Mr. 
Mr. Linney, this this isn't a turf battle type of thing, is it? You're trying to find the the, the best balance on this. Is that the is that the solution of of working together, best practices, the, the the two agencies? Because I recognize the two of you could go and do anything else anywhere else. You've chosen to be here for a reason. You believe in this program. You want to make it work. And if we don't get it right, the the critics will be proven correct, and and that means we can lose programs like this. So is it? Are we moving in the right direction, in your opinion? Uh, Congressman Waltz, there is no turf battle here. Uh, I would be happy if the SBA were to take this take this burden on. Uh, <laughs> I would save me about 30 hours a week, mostly in the evening. Uh, yeah. I talk to veteran business people every night. Uh, so if John would like to take that task but on. But they need you, uh, don't they? This idea I'd of one-stop shopping is my, my, my internal bias towards the VA on veterans' issues, I think, comes out of practice and, and you know, effectiveness. I think it's important to understand, Congressman, there's a fundamental difference here. Last year, we verified, we made determinations on 5,900 firms. The SBA did 37 status protests. We did 436 requests for reconsideration. They have two administrative judges in OHA. Uh, our, I w and I would note that our request for reconsideration is not an appeal process. If they need to appeal, they come to me and they say, we think a mistake has been made. Our Office of General Counsel makes a determination was a mistake made. If we determine and in less than 2 percent of the cases was there a mistake, we then allow them to do what I call a second chance program. Request for reconsideration is the ability to, if you were found noncompliant and, and you were truly noncompliant, you can correct it. We have, t we have worked very closely with the SBA. We are taking a leaf out of the 8A book where we have initiated, we are doing pilots as we speak. On 1 May, we will be initiating the predetermination findings program where prior to a determination, we will be reaching out to the veteran. We'll be giving them a preliminary findings, all the things we found wrong. And I will tell you, we try very hard to find it all the first time. I have eight pages of metrics and statistics. We track a lot of things. Uh, and one of the things we track is how many times do we have an incomplete determination? Nine percent. Nine percent of the time is the numbers that, we've, that we have. So, yes, we try to make those corrections. But we're doing this predetermination findings process so that we don't have to get to the termination. They get a chance to fix it. We're, we're doing the same thing the 8A program been, learning their lessons and adopting their best practice, reaching out, having the conversation. As many of the people in the first panel mentioned, there has not been that kind of a dialogue. So we're trying to, we're trying to take advantage of, of things that other people are doing to make the progress better. And I would note, we did 569 determinations in February. The average time was 34 days. The regulation gives us 60. So I think we, at, in June of 2011, it was over 130 days. So I think we've made some progress. And we certainly need to acknowledge it when we do that. There's a lot of folks working hard to make that happen. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Waltz. Uh, Ms. Um, Meng uh, from the State of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the VA has indicated that it wishes to collaborate with SBA in its efforts to develop a new data system. Uh, Mr. Shiraka, uh, SBA has been developing a new data system to manage its 8A and hub zone program. What attributes of the data system SBA is currently developing hold the most promise for providing a model for completion of a VA data system? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as Mr. Lenny mentioned, um, we have been working together uh, to share best practices, not only around processes and metrics, uh, but on systems as well. Uh, we are in the process, and we have been over the last year, in implementing uh, what we call one track, which will uh, be the system for our 8A and our hub zone program. Um, the process is well on its way, where at this point it would be difficult to adjust the system to accommodate uh, the specific uh, necessities or requirements of the uh, uh, veteran program. But what we have uh, committed to do is share system requirements, to share uh, statements of work, to make sure that the front end 
level of work that the VA would have to uh, uh, go through in getting a new system up and running could be minimized as much as possible. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Wang. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bintavolio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's see if I understand this correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, if I want to be certified VA, I go through SB, SBA, get certified first, and then go to him, or go just to him. Is that right? So if, if you are a veteran-owned, service-disabled small business, uh, and you want to work with the rest of the federal government and not the VA, you can self-certify yourself in the system for award management. Um, now, where the SBA gets involved in that process is if there is a protest on a specific bid that you may have bid on, any interested party can protest that award. The VA uh, system is a front-end certification program, very similar to our 8A program, where the firm goes through a certification and documentation process, which can take a period of time before any award is made, uh, but that is when the firm is actually certified into the program. And in the case of the SDVOSB, for the VA, that program is to do contracting with the Veterans Administration. Okay. So, well, what I, I guess what I'm leading to is when I came home from Iraq, I was considering getting a government job. I eventually got it, but it was different type than I expected. Um, and uh, the, the application process was very expensive. But um, uh, when, I applied, when I applied for that um, government job, there was a space where all I had to do was click that I was a veteran. And then I got, uh, had to click another spot for the application if I was a disabled veteran, right? Now, it would seem to me that you and you are both looking for qualified, first of all, qualified contractors to do government work. You are specifically VA. But you have some of the same criteria he does, except yours is you have to have a DD Form 214, prove that you are a veteran, and I have to have certification that I have to submit from the VA to, well, to prove that I am a disabled veteran, correct? Why can't you just and I understand there's some regulation differences, but wouldn't it be simpler for me to, as a veteran just to come to you and say, hey, I need this uh, certification that I'm a disabled veteran, and I need a DD Form 214 sent to him, official copy, and you verify me or label me as a disabled business or a disabled veteran that owns a business with the other additional requirements, 51 percent owned, one or more vets. Um, and I missed number three, and I didn't understand three, and I didn't understand four. But with, with regards to the documentation, in the case of a protest, that documentation, which is either um, uh, received from the VA or the Department of Defense, or in some cases um, um, uh, the Federal Government or, 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 or other agencies, um, that documentation is necessary for us as well, but only in the case of a protest. Okay. Not but, on the front end. But it would seem to be um, less troublesome if I just went to the SBA and just handed you my, or you got an official copy. I mean, doesn't that make sense, or am I missing something here? Congressman, it's al always less troublesome to self-certify. It's always more troublesome when somebody checks. And okay. in the VA, we check. Well, you, ver you check that I'm a uh, disabled vet. We do. Right? And you check that I'm a veteran. You have a copy of my DD Form 214, correct? Yes. All right. So if I was applying for a government job and I have to verify that I have a college degree, I have to send an official transcript from my school. I don't. The school does to an employer or another school, for instance. Why can't the same happen from you? A certified copy from VA goes directly to SBA. In fact, one of the things that we have been doing in this collaborative effort is looking at where we can have a single portal sharing information. As we looked at the technology platforms that support the 8A and the, the uh, HUBZone program and the technology platform that supports the, uh, our vet, uh, vet FIRST program, 
that's one of the things we're looking at. Can we, can we create a system whereby a person enters his data one time and is used by multiple programs? Yeah, and it seems to me that SBA has more experience in business and VA is more experienced than veterans. They could simply send over to you official documents that it's VA, meet these other requirements, you verify it, and it's done, done deal. Seems rather simple to me. The only, the only thing that I would add is that, obviously, statutorily, the VA program is a, a full certification front-end program that certifies not only uh, the status but also um, that, that the if firm is indeed small, where our program, again, is a self-certification program that, uh, under protest, we will determine status and size. I understand. So we need to change the regulation. Okay, good. You get with me and I'll do what I can. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chu, California, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lenny, the GAO report released earlier this month noted that the VA had not shared their comprehensive long-term strategic plan with key stakeholders such as veteran support organizations and congressional staff and committees. Moving forward, uh, I think there are many of us on the Small Business Committee that would like to be more engaged on this issue with the VA. Um, what steps have you taken or are planning to take to ensure that key stakeholders are involved in the VA's verification programs, plans, and priorities? Uh, that's an excellent question. We've reached out to many of the stakeholders. In fact, uh, all the people on the first panel uh, are part of our outreach effort. Uh, and I think we, particularly with, it, with, with respect to the rules, uh, in, in, with respect to a long-range plan, when I came to the VA, the Secretary looked at me and had a two-word mission statement, fix verification. Uh, we had the kind of problems that I didn't need to be taking, looking through a five-year crystal ball. Uh, the problems were in the trench with us. Uh, now that we have cleared many of those problems, we now have a five-year plan that has gone through a uh, rigorous review process. The Secretary last uh, summer established an SES uh, review task force to look at verification. That plan has been briefed to this task force. It will be briefed uh, next month to the Office of the Secretary, and then we will be sharing it with the stakeholder community and be happy to share it with the uh, members of, of this committee. Uh, we, have no, we have no secrets. But uh, when the enemy's in the trench with you, you deal with the enemy in the trench first because we had a lot of small businesses that were being tremendously disadvantaged when you have a process that takes 130 days on average. Uh, now we're at a process that took 34 days last month. So mm -hmm. we're in a position to think long term. So um, all this outreach took place since the GAO report. Is that what you're saying? No, ma'am. We've been we've been conducting outreach since uh, I can speak personally since April 2011. And why is it that the GAO report said that uh, there had not been the sharing? What they spoke about has not been the sharing of a of a five year strategic plan. What they their report referred to was the, the a specific document, which is a five year plan. We had strategic planning documents. Uh, many of those issues have been shared with stakeholders, but we did not have a comprehensive five-year plan. That's what they were referring to. Hmm. Um, well, I wanted to ask about the appeal process uh, next. Uh, Mr. Shiraka, the appeal process in the SBA Office of Hearing uh, and Appeals is, is about 15 days. Of course, the old GA, I mean, the GA reports at 130 days, uh, but now you're saying 34 days as of last month. But Nonetheless, the appeal process at SBA is still faster than what it is at the VA. Um, so what more could the VA do to be similar to the, to the SBA in speeding up the, the uh, review process? With regards to the process at the SBA, um, as I mentioned earlier in, in my testimony, my office makes the initial determination uh, with regards to status. Uh, the firm uh, or entity has the opportunity to appeal it to the Office of uh, Hearings and Appeals, which is an independent body which can make a determination as to the facts of, of the case. Um, and that process uh, helps to um, ensure consistency in the programs, having that outside uh, review and, and determination. Um, but it, it, it's an independent process that takes place at the SBA. Mm -hmm. Separate and apart from my office. Well, some in the earlier panel was suggesting that the the 
SBA handle the appeals? And um, I'm wondering whether the SBA would have the capability of handling the appeals process for the VA. Yeah, I think so. I know that that, that has been a discussion, and, and we've heard uh, that discussion. I think obviously um, it may have uh, certain impacts that may not have been studied yet. I think uh, the entirety of the various impacts that uh, uh, initiating an OHA appeal process for the VA. Uh, determination or status determination process. There could be impacts to their program. There could be impacts to our program. Obviously, I think there is a resource question. Um, uh, as we have heard here today, they have a significant number of determinations they make every year. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, we are sort of uh, resource limited in our Office of Hearing and Appeals. So those types of things, the impacts and the resources, would certainly have to be studied before any sort of recommendation, I think, uh, should be made. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Chu. Um, Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Lini, uh, um, CV's effort um, to balance uh, verification with fraud is due in part to our criticism over the past two years. Uh, but you swung hard uh, in the opposite direction. Do you have a long-term strategic plan to find a balance in verification? Um, GAO says uh, you don't have a plan. Yes, sir. We have a long-term strategic plan. Uh, we did swing hard, uh, in part in response to the urging of this panel uh, and this committee uh, to make sure uh, that no ineligible firm was able to take advantage of the program that you created for veteran-owned small businesses. So our first priority was to make sure that that didn't happen. Our second priority was to make sure we then streamlined the process in order to that eligible firms, that legitimate firms, could get through the process quickly, and we have done that. Our third priority is to, was to look at the rules. We had a mature rule. We had a mature set of interpretations. And now that we have looked at the process, uh, we are now looking at the rule, and we have made changes. As I said, uh, as of Friday, t transfer restrictions are not an interpretation that will, will cause a firm to be ineligible. But we had to do a lot of fixing. People have made comments about the staff of CVE. I would note that 60 percent of the staff of CVE have audit background, 33 percent have IG experience, 33 percent are lawyers, 53 percent have a business degree, and 40 percent are former small business owners. So we have brought a different staff together. That staff is almost entirely new uh, over the last 14 months to make sure we put together the kind of expertise that enables us to have a program that meets the, the uh, objectives that have been set for us. Mr. Lini, uh, CBE uh, has forgotten how to fulfill the advocacy role that was mandated in lieu of verification. Uh, how will you find further balance there? Uh, that role has uh, not been forgotten. It is part of the, as uh, uh, Chairman Hanna mentioned, is part of the Ozdebu mission. That uh, remains part of my mission. We, ha we are uh, pulling in a, a new program called Vet Transfer, which is about capacity building for budding uh, veteran entrepreneurs. Uh, it is just that the Center for Veteran Enterprise, its mission has changed. You are correct, sir, uh, dramatically. Uh, its full-time focus now is to ensure that firms uh, can, can gain access uh, to the Veteran First program and to ensure that only eligible firms gain access. Okay. Um, Mr. Lini, SBA's Office of Hearing and Appeals noted uh, 14 size appeals size appeal decisions in connection with uh, SDVO set-asides that reflected poorly on SVE's determinations. Can you explain the use of the Office of General Counsel for CVO approval given this issue? Uh, first, it is important to note that we do not do size determinations in the VA. All size deter our policy is all size determinations are referred to the SBA. Uh, uh, CFR 121 is about the determination of size. We do not match up to 121 because we don't determine size. We defer to the SBA on that on that subject. I, th I believe the statistic you're referring to is in in those cases 
the Office of Hearing Appeals determined that we had uh, uh, not made, uh, we should have made a uh, size request to the SBA, which we, when we did not. Uh, we look at ownership and control. If a firm is eligible in any of its NAICS codes, we do not deny their eligibility. If we believe the firm is a large business in all of the NAICS codes that it references, then we refer them to the SBA. Let me do a fo follow-up last question. Uh, all SBA decisions can be appealed to the Office of Hearing, uh, Hearings and Appeals, which has independent administrative judges, is bound by precedent, and publishes its decisions. But VA's OGC handles appeals uh, for CVE. It is, VA's, is it VA's belief that their appeals process is as complete and transparent as SBA's? Uh, just a, a point of fact, the Office of General Counsel does not handle appeals. The Office of General Counsel we utilize in our request for reconsideration. And I want to be very clear that that is not an appeals process. That is a second chance process. Uh, the actual the appeals come to me. Uh, I, I have no objection to making the results of those appeals public. Uh, we have not in the past. Uh, but the, the issue that we have found, sir, is not so much uh, the need for appeal, it is the need for s speedy action. Well, speedy action, but I really, boy, not making those, those results public and, and then calling, I, I think, instead of an appeal, you call it a second chance or, or the two different, I mean, that just, uh, that is just not a transparent process that could be deemed objective, I think, by any standard. I mean, uh, would you commit here today to make that, that process public? Uh, I have no objection to making the process public, sir. Very well. I will watch for that. And, uh, Mr. Hanna, Chairman Hanna. Thank you. Uh, it is my understanding that at one time the SBA and the VA discussed having SBA conduct verifications on VA's behalf. Where is where's that going? What have you done with those negotiations? Are they ongoing? We have not pursued it because it was too expensive. They wanted a million dollars <laughs> to, to do 40. Mm -hmm. We do 5,600. So the thirty million you get wouldn't help. The thirty million we get, if I use, if my multiplication is correct, uh, wouldn't get us to the fifty-four hundred. It would only get me to twelve hundred. Thank you. Yes, would you like to comment on that, Mr. Shiraka? Yes, I think so. Um, I believe those discussions were held before my time at the uh, agency. Um, I'm not necessarily aware of the the quote of a million dollars, but what I will say is that. Um, obviously, it is a resource question. Uh, obviously, even when we talk about the process of OHA, uh, as the Congresswoman uh, mentioned with respect to uh, the SBA taking over the, the OHA responsibilities for the VA and allowing an appeals process is a resource question. The, and, and as I mentioned again, the impact on the various programs. Statutorily, it is a, uh, a full certification program. How would that impact uh, those requirements and, and how can we study those impacts? Thank you. How much do you spend uh, verifying the program, the 8A program? Thank you. So the, um, I, I have the, um, I don't know if I have the static statistics on the 8A program. Uh, I can tell you that in our certification program, uh, as you probably know, the 8A program is not just a contracting program. It's a business development program. It's a nine-year program where the firm uh, receives technical assistance to be able, after the nine years, uh, to, to be uh, com competitive on the free and uh, open market. Um, but what I would mention is that we have approximately 19 of our staff involved in the certification process uh, at, at the SBA. I don't have an exact dollar number on what those 19 cost, but I can certainly uh, get that information yeah, for you. Perhaps as many as a million vets, many of whom will apply for this. Are you, you both prepared to handle that load? And it is going to increase. How do, how's it? Uh... So our, our 8A program allows uh, somewhere between 600 and 800 firms into the program annually. Mm -hmm. Our acceptance rate is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. So you can imagine that we probably review about double that, 1,600, 1,800. Uh, f um, applications annually. Obviously, I think if you are looking at a uh, certification front-end program, that has significant resource allocation questions. Uh, thank you very much. No further questions, Chairman? 
Our thanks to the panel. Uh, uh, you are now excused. I kneel, yield to Chairman Hanna for his closing remarks. I want to join uh, Chairman Kaufman in extending my thanks to all of our witnesses. I think this hearing has helped us better understand the problems our service disabled veterans are facing when they seek to do business with the Federal Government. I look forward to working with my colleagues on Veterans Affairs Committee to see how we can do a better job of serving all those who have served us so well. I ask unanimous consent that the members have five legislative days to sub submit statements supporting materials for the record. Uh, hearing no without uh, objection, so ordered. Thank, thank you. This hearing is now concluded.